me. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy glory. Revive us again. Thank you, Herb. And thank you, audience. And I always read to you some of our emails before I teach. And I've got several emails. I got one from Jenny Moody. She's a regular here at Grace and Truth. She's been with us for 20 years, something like that. Jenny writes to us. She lives up here in Gallatin. We love you, Judy. Jenny, I'll get in right a minute. Hello, Jim and Mary. I saw you at Chip Tolay the other day. That's a restaurant here. was standing right behind you guys, but my brain did not register that it was you until you started ordering your burrito. That was one big burrito. You had company, so did not want to disturb you, but both y'all looked great. It seemed to be enjoying your day and was good to see. Would like to send Julie in Australia some encouraging correspondence after hearing about her health situation. If you could send me her mailing address, I would appreciate it. Only if you think she would not mind. I'm sure she wouldn't. Agape and Flay always, Ju Jenny Moody. Thank you, Jenny. We love you, lady. You are a sweet lady. Thank you so much. And Dane in Indiana. Hello, Jim. Thank you for your in-depth studies. What are your thoughts on the Christian nationalism movement? I don't know what that is. I can't keep up with all the different movements. There's a whole, hey, <laughs> there's Susan down here. Those in Christ are such, what about a movement? Shout out and Rob and Charles. I don't know what that means. Thank you, Dean in Indiana. I don't really go with movements. I don't believe. I believe when people are sitting in or they're having a march against something, I don't really go along with that. I believe in teaching truth. And then, uh, thank you, Dean. Keep writing to us and explain to me what you mean. Willis in K Kenya, Africa writes to us. It's been a while, Pastor. I think I thank God who kept us alive. Joy fills my heart whenever you, we see you going strong, both physically and spiritually at this age. We know it's not for nothing for God to allow us to sit listening to you feed us. I have continued to receive the DVDs of which I am grateful. I have never... I, will, I have never known that preaching takes a lot of work and time like I'm experiencing today. I have made it routine of sharing the word by simply taking the statement of faith, of grace and truth, and opening it up for people using simple words in our vernacular language for the ordinary people to understand. This, too, requires God. We are in this ministry for life uh, and putting more effort and dedication like it's issue of life and death uh, and it is a friend once told me that matters of faith is like life and death and that i should be very careful when preaching because i am going against the norms of the churches. Well, you're going to go against the norm of the churches when you preach against Christmas and the other holidays and you preach predestination. My response was that over this new belief, grace and truth, I'm ready to die for. Good for you. I'm glad they view, they view me differently. Pastor Jim, when you will have be having a picnic over there. I will organize one with my family and a few brethren here and use the occasion to extend the gospel. Anyway, greet for me, Mama Mary, Tom, Mike, and the entire family of grace and truth. Bye for now. I'm your son in the faith, Willis in Kenya, Africa. We love you, Willis. Uh, just keep writing to us. And I got some YouTube comments. These people, a lot of times, they don't like me. And uh, some of them do and some of them don't. 
I've got several YouTube comments here. I'll read them to you. Francis Cavazzo commented on why we do not believe in millennium or pre-trib rapture. Last Trump eliminates both. Because you're an ignorant teacher, <laughs> I think that's funny. Ignorant means unlearned, and I've learned a lot in my life. Or prejudice because you always know you don't read the contract with the nation. I don't even know what you mean by that. We are all the promises and blessings that are in the restoration time visual occurred on the millennium. I don't believe in the millennium. It's not millennium. It's Kelia in the Greek. I don't even know how to comment on that, Francis. You sound like you're ignorant. Uh, Al Bizer's A L B I Z U R E S commented on predestination, lexical intrusion, definition, grammatical force, linguistic syntax. I've been grappling with understanding the concept of predestination in every aspect of life, especially in relation to individuals. I understand that salvation is by grace. Grace, charis, means unmerited favor. And we are predestined to be saved by grace in Christ Jesus. No, not, not exactly that. We are predestined to be saved, but predestination is a verb, and a verb has has a has to have a receiving of the action of the verb. Predestinate is prohorizo. If you're struggling with prohorizo, that's the thing. That's the Greek word. Predestinate is an English word. It's not the word in the original text. Whom he did for no, he also did predestinate. Pro means before. It's our prefix pre. It actually is our word, word pre. And horizo, H-O-R-I-Z-O. -O. There are no H's in the Greek. There's a diacritical mark that has a breathing sound. Horizo. Horizo is the verb form. Verb form. It's an action verb, verb form of horizon. That's where the light shines. So God has predetermined us to be in the light and to walk in the light. That's what it's about. He's predestined us to be conformed. I keep saying this. To be conformed is one word in the Greek, sumarphos, S-U-M, M-O-R-P-H-O-S. Sumarphos is a verbal verbal noun. It means there, the action has to be taken upon the whom. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. To be conformed to the image icon. Likeness. You've got to go back to the original Greek text in the concordance and in an interlinear Bible. Icon means likeness. We're predestined to be in the likeness of Jesus. That's the pathway to heaven. We have to go through fire and trial and persecution. I was talking to Tracy before we started that I've been through a lot of things that I'm not pleased with in my life. I'm not pleased with my past. That's called repentance. I'm, I regret it. If you regret some of the things you've gone through, I regret my life. I was out there trying to be somebody. You are somebody when you're chosen by God. You're elect. You're favored by God. You are somebody. I didn't realize the mistakes I was making. I've made, I have made more mistakes than anybody in this room. Just foolish, stupid ways of living. Because I was seeking something that was endless. I was seeking self. Thank God I got out of that. And then he says, I understand that salvation is by grace and we're predestined to be saved. Well, no, we're predestined to conform. That's the pathway there. However, I wonder about 
the role of free will. There is no free will. We're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God's will. John 1, 13. It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mirth in Romans 9. I wonder about the role of free will in our daily struggles. It's not free will. God is guiding you. God turns you in a direction, then he withdraws his hand from you and lets you go to your sin. And then he stops you when he's ready. It's just, see, you say, I don't understand that. You're not supposed to. The Bible says, God says, your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. You can't think like I think. When you say, I don't understand that, you're not supposed to. You just say, God's will is being done. And development as children of the Lord our God. Specifically, when it comes to doing His will in our walk of faith, sometimes we choose to follow His will, and other times we may not. You're exactly right. We follow self-will. I keep saying there's two men in every believer. There's an inner man that serves the law of God. There's an outer man that serves the law of the flesh. That's what Paul said in Romans 7th chapter, Colossians the 3rd chapter, Ephesians the 4th chapter, and 2 Corinthians the 4th chapter. Look at those. It seems like more than seems like more than predestination. It's as if our choices are more like predisposition because God allows us to choose which path to take. Well, in a sense that's true. We choose our paths, but only because God has ordained that. He's ordained our will. His way or our own. We inevitably face consequences for our actions exactly. As seen in the story of Jonah the prophet, despite being saved by grace, Jonah disobeyed God's command to go to Nineveh and suffered greatly because of his actions and will. You're exactly right. But it's still all the will. He works all things after the counsel of his own will, including your sin. He pulls off. It's, I can tell you a life story. And God has beat the living tar out of me to cause me to be willing to be right here today. I was trying to be a world-famous singer and a world-famous... used to have a real high voice, real high tenor voice. Don't have that anymore. Don't even hardly have a voice. I can't hardly sing. And I don't, I don't care about that anymore. You know why you do something that's in sin? Because you're capable of it and you're good at it. That's why you do it. I used to be good at saying I'm not anymore. Through his repentance, he was restored and ultimately fulfilled the Lord's will. That's what I'm doing. I'm fulfilling the Lord's will in my life, but I wasn't for years. This raises questions about interplay between predestination and free will. There's no free will. God is in control of everything. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Not in every good thing, in everything. First Thessalonians 5, 18. In God's sovereignty in our lives. Well, Al Bazurs, you've getting hold of a lot of it, but you got to let go of it when you can't understand what God is doing. He said, your ways aren't my ways, your thoughts aren't my thoughts. We're just human beings. He's God. Got to keep remembering that. Kiwi Christian commented on the 70 weeks of Daniel. The 70 weeks is the end of time. Thank the Lord Jesus for preachers like Bill Parker and Scott Price. I don't know them. Sonny Hernandez, Richard Warmack, and Jason Booth. They all teach truth. I don't even know who they are. If they're Charismatics or Pentecostals, I'm not going to like them. You keep writing to us if you want to, Kiwi Christian. I don't know what you meant by that, and I don't even know who they are. I'll look them up. Michael James commented on Mark of the Beast is 
false, easy gospels. Another Jesus removing the bound. Hi, Jim. In 1 Corinthians 11, there is a warning to those who partake of the bread and drink of the cup unworthily. He's not talking about a literal cup, and he's not talking about literal bread. He's talking about we being many are one bread and one body. To drink of a cup meant to undergo a death. That they eat and drink damnation to themselves, not damnation in hell. You need to watch my DVDs. Well, what is never explained is that Paul is rebuking those who come to these feasts before everyone else and eat all the food. He goes on to tell those same people that if you're hungry, eat at home. That's true. Finally, he concludes with, therefore, wait for everyone to arrive before eating and drinking. Shouldn't our explanation of eating and drinking damnation? Well, it's not talking about damnation of the soul. This is a long story. I could try to make it short. At the Passover and all the festivals, they would send out men to repair the roads. The Pharisees would. And when they repair the roads, they'd come across... Uh, if they came across a dead body, they had to bury it right where it was and paint it with, with whited lime, and they called that a whited sepulcher. And the men that were burying these bodies, they had to stay away from the Passover, the other festivals, for 30 days, and they came to the Passover 30 days later. If they went directly to the Passover, when they had come in contact with a dead body, then they then they were partaking unworthily. And Jesus called the Pharisees, he said in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, you're like whited sepulchers. Stay away from Pharisees. If you try to partake of Christ's body, which is the word of God, coming to church and you're running around with dead bodies, you're partaking of God's word unworthily. That's what that's talking about. Shouldn't our explanation of eating, drinking, damnation to oneself interpret in the light of this historical situation? In other words, given Paul's serious displeasure with these hogging up all the food, you don't understand what you're talking about. He's talking about spiritual. That was called an agape love feast, and we still are an agape love feast every day. I would think he had them in mind as those that were unworthy. You don't understand unworthy. Unworthy is anaxios, A-N-A-X-I-O-S. It comes from axios, which is a mathematical term, axiom. It means to partake unequally. Unequally is actually the alpha primitive in front of axios, the alpha primitive in front of axios. That means you're partaking without a balanced equation. That's what algebra is about, is balancing the equation. God is speaking algebra right here. I want to understand this from this perspective in immediate context to explain to people in my church why I don't take communion. You shouldn't be taking it anyway. Because they weren't partaking of communion, they were partaking of the last Passover, and we are in a spiritual Passover. When he said, the cup of blessing which we bless there in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, cup of blessing was a spiritual term. It was the third cup of the Passover. What you need to do is you need to get Alfred Edersheim's book on the templeless ministry and services. There's a chapter in there about the Passover, and right at the top of the page, it's got third cup of the Passover. Is the, is the, that was the third cup of the Passover was called cup of blessing. You really mixed up just like all the preachers. You don't need to take communion anyway. That's not what they were doing. There was a lamb there. In Luke, the same chapter, same thing, Luke 22, 7, says it came time to kill the Passover. They had a lamb to kill. So if you're taking communion, somebody needs to pass around a leg of lamb. 
You're not supposed to be t taking, drinking uh, grape juice and eating a cookie, a cracker. That's not what they were doing. They were partaking of the Passover. It's as if the context doesn't even exist here. It doesn't exist the way you're talking about it. I never heard anyone take this gluttony into account. It was... I'm not going to go any further on that. You need to watch some of my tapes on 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Keep on writing to us, Michael. Darky Ja Anderson Jehovah, Jehovah's Son, writes to us on Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, signs of the end time love waxing cold. You do know who Antichrist is, like what utter nonsense. You must be nonsensical yourself to say this is nonsense. I don't know who the Antichrist is. Antichrist is only mentioned in First and Second John. Look it up in your look up Antichrist in your concordance. That's the only place you find it. Philip Buckley writes to us, wrote on the bill of divorce and remarriage, God's approval, preachers who condemn know nothing. It don't take time to tag this speaker. One spouse for life, that is your covenant. Good luck on judgment day as the teacher receives a greater judgment. You must be stupid. You're going to condemn me. I don't believe in you at all, Philip Buckley. Billy Ray Crawford writes to us on God's Sovereign Pinwheel. Part 4, Why Most Baptists Hate Spiritual Israel. Thanks to God for leading me to Grace and Truth Ministries and for Shepherd Jim Brown. Thank you. Uh, maybe you need to talk to that other guy that wants to condemn me. I can't believe you want to condemn somebody and you know nothing about them. And then Clarice Sherry Blossom I guess it's one of these here. Two pretty girls, huh? Maybe one's a lady and one's a girl. I don't know. Let me see here. Hello, Aunt Mary and Uncle Jim. It's been a while. I hope you're doing well. We've been busy and I've seen and I've been very sick. Also, my little sister, Clarizna, got married recently. Goodness. Did she keep me busy? She was the most beautiful bride. I'll send you some pictures. I've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism and been feeling ill ever since. My energy is low and concentration span is short. Well, my daughter-in-law, Karen, has got a thyroid problem. Her thyroid is dying. It's calling, causing her to gain weight. I've been trying my best to keep up with you, Uncle Jim. <laughs> I guess I'm Uncle Jim. It's always a pleasure listening to you teaching the Bible truth. Every time I fall short, I always find myself back to spending time in prayer, praising him in song, repenting in Bible study. I've been telling a lot of people about grace and truth. I hope they really listen, have their ears Eyes and ears open. May God bless you, Aunt Mary. Lots of agape. Clarice. I guess Clarice must be the one in the red because she said that was her niece or daughter or something. She said she's the bride, the one on the left. And this is them here. That's the wedding party. If you want to look at these, you can come up here and look at them after church. All right. I got a few announcements to make. Uh, let me get me a drink. D-R-A-N-K. That's the way it's pronounced in Texas. Drink. Drink of water. Have you ever swallowed a pill? A real bunch of pills, and and it hurts your throat. I felt like it cut my throat the other night, and it's been bothering me ever since. But so much for that. Forget it. I'll get over it. <laughs> um, 
I'm looking for a car for a lady up in Paducah, Kentucky. She moved to Paducah. Her name is Deborah Wiley. And uh, she must be Mrs. Wiley. <laughs> if you remember that from Andy Griffith. Um, but she's moved there from Arizona. And she moved in with some friends. The wife doesn't like predestination. She's a Pentecostal. She doesn't like Christmas being pagan. And her husband likes the truth. And I said, you got to get out of there. But she only makes $900 a month. Social Security, she's 65. And she can't afford to get out. And if she had a car, she could leave somehow. And I'm not asking you to... If you got a an old car that's cheap. Uh, maybe we could give six or seven hundred dollars for it. I wouldn't mind doing that. If you got one that's cheap, that runs good, we could get it up to her in Paducah. She really needs some help. I got to read one other thing to you. I read it before, and I got to read it to you. It's the one of the funniest. Uh, Emails I've ever gotten. It's so good. I, I just like reading it. I read it before, but I'm going to read it again. This was from Robert Himmelstein. And uh, he, the title of it is Angry. It's very funny. I don't know if he didn't understand or if he's pulling my leg or what. Dear Jim, I live in Pennsylvania. My friend started me listening to you a couple of weeks ago on YouTube, and you started making sense to me until I listened to you with my friend. He kept asking me, what is this Texas, Texas, Texas Receptus? Texas Receptus. This guy is talking about, talking about me. So I looked the term up, and oh boy, was I surprised. What came up was a wide re every wide receiver in Texans in the Texans football team. So being a Steelers fan, I just can I can't listen to you anymore. I asked my friend who recommended I listen to you if you ever talked about football, and he said you were a football fan. I didn't know which team, and I and then I looked up where you were. And I found out you were in Tennessee, the same state where the Houston Oilers moved to. They became the Titans. Then it made sense. You're trying to convince everyone in the world to root for the football teams that originally come from Texas. <laughs> for we cannot watch or listen to you anymore. You are a sneaky man, but I will check and listen from time to time to keep tabs on you and warn others. Agape. Textus Receptus is the original text of the Bible. Has nothing to do with Texas. It's, this is the Textus Receptus. It's not a wide receiver for the Houston Oilers. The Houston Oilers are defunct. They're now the Tennessee Titans, but it's not a wide receiver. Or it's not a tight end. Whatever that is. It's a guy on the end that runs and catches passes. That's what Kelsey is there with the with the Kansas City Chiefs. He's a tight end. I just thought that was funny. I may read that again. I just think that's I don't know if he was pulling my leg or not. I just thought it was funny. I had to read it again. We try to help people that we got a lot of needy people around the world. And I give I don't give, you give. I, I'm kind of in charge of it since I'm the pastor, but I guess I would be, wouldn't I? <laughs> I we give money to people who are really hurting. Some of them have debilitating diseases, and some of them are just really struggling. Some of them may be near death. We don't know. We send $300 a month to a lady in in Australia, she's got 
cancer and it keeps coming and going and uh, she goes into remission comes out and, and it moves in some of her part of her body and uh, we send her three hundred dollars a month and then we got a lady in in uh, Amarillo, Texas, Robin Peters, and she's got leukemia. We send her 300 a month, every month, to both these two people. We've got a lady out here in Murfreesboro, she's in a struggle with trying to raise her grandkids because her daughter was on drugs. We send her 300 a month, Amanda Meadows, and then we send to other people around the country, 50 and 100 and 200. Got a lady down in southern Louisiana and Danielle Thigpen. Danielle is having one of the hardest times anybody I know. Here about a year ago, I put out an appeal. She is uh, paraplegic. She was driving to her mother's house about 16 years ago. Fell asleep, run into a tree or a telephone post or something and she became paraplegic. She can't move from her waist down. And um, she wa saw us on TV in uh, Baton Rouge. And she just loves the truth. She loves predestination. She said she knows that was the will of God, that she ran into that tree and that she's crippled because it's what God wants. And she's not only struggling with that, but she's got a disease where she's got holes in her arms that goes down to the bone and in her hips and in her legs. I don't know what that is. It's something serious. One lady wrote to us and said she studied it, and it's some kind of a, a disease that eats away at your skin. But you, she's even sent me pictures of it, and it goes all the way to the bone, maybe, maybe this wide, maybe an inch and a half two inches wide down to the bone and uh, she has to go through this government program in order for us to buy her that van and she's she's uh, she can't help what she's got it's just the way it is and uh, and she's got to go through this program so the government will pay half of the van if they pay half the van the van costs 85000 with all the attachments to it, then they will pay for the attachments for the uh, the little, there'll be a remote that she punches, it'll open the doors, the little side uh, uh, incline will come down where she could roll her, her wheelchair up there and roll it up into the driver's position. The government will have to teach her how to drive that, but she's got to get well enough to go through that program first. And she's got this real bad sickness where she's got these holes in her body, and I don't know what that is. I've never even heard of that before. And uh, But I've got pictures of it, and uh, it's got to be something really bad. But we're going to help her with this van and if she can get to a place where she can take this pro this government program so they can step in here and they'll tell me when to buy the van it's the money's in the bank across the street in bank of america and it's going to be there it's in the benevolent fund and nobody can touch it but me and nobody's going to get it it's for her and uh, we are on uh TV around the country. We're also on TV in Nashville on Comcast television uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night. And uh, we are on, uh, on channel 49 on Comcast, or you can call it Xfinity, at 8.30, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, and Sunday morning at 9.00. And uh, we just want to help. We want you to help these people. If you want to help these people that I'm talking about and send an offering to the ministry, we're trying to get a building fund together. We've got a building fund. We've got a considerable amount in it. But it's going to take another 
500,000, 600,000 to build the building. And, uh, and we want a building not any bigger than what we're in. Well, I just hate paying this rent out $1,600 every month uh, for this. All we need is this much room. We don't need any more than we got here. Enough to seat 100 people. When you're teaching predestination, you're teaching Christmas and Easter are pagan. You're preaching daily cross and death to self and self-denial. People don't like that message. And it's not, we will never have a big crowd. You can't have a mega church preaching these truths. It won't happen. That's why anybody that's got a mega church, they're compromising. I believe John MacArthur is preaching some truth, but I believe he's compromising on Christmas, on Easter, on even on predestination, because he says predestination and free will walk hand in hand. They do not, John. They do not. And uh, I just, I'm, I've been real disappointed in John. I used to follow him in the early 80s. And I kept listening to him, and I said, he's saying some things that's not true. He's got a pre-trib rapture. He's got, he's got millennium. He's got water baptism. He's got crackers and grape juice and communion. And I can't, I can't put my approval on that at all. But anyway, uh, just if you want to be a part of this ministry, look at our website, Grace and Truth. Dot net. That's grace and truth dot net. And if you want a free DVD, we'll send it to you. We'll send you free DVDs from now on. You just call us and stay in touch with us. And every Sunday and Wednesday that we do these, they'll be yours. Uh, we have our picnic, our yearly picnic coming up. Uh, May the 18th down here at Moss Wright Park in the edge of Goodlessville. That's just right next door to Hendersonville. But Moss Wright Park. And if you want to come, you can bring a covered dish, uh, whatever you want to bring, some Kentucky Fried Chicken or, or Popeye's Chicken or whatever you like. And... Uh, so just come and join us in Moss Wright Park. We'll be meeting probably here, be, here at the church about 9 o'clock. That way we can lead everybody down there. It's not far from here. It's real close. So stay in touch with us. And um, we'll, if you want a free DVD, if you want to support the ministry, we, we have a large overhead. We're a small group. Most of our congregation is on the internet all over the world, and we got people that write from everywhere. But uh, we do have about forty-eight thousand, forty-seven thousand dollars a month we have to bring in to break even, just to break even. And when we get over that, we that goes into the building fund. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. God, help me this morning to, to uh, say the truth that will challenge people. Lord, I pray that you'll fight our battles for us. We thank you for everything. Forgive us of our sin. And God, we mean that. And we'll give you the praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Well, hi, Britta. How you doing? <laughs> That's Britta. 
Is that B-R-I-T-A or B-R-T-T-A? One T. Is that short for something? Not short, just Brita. Okay. I didn't I didn't know if it was short for Britain or British or what. You get called do you get called Britain? Or do you get called Great Britain? I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always introduce myself because we live stream every Sunday at 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. And then we live stream Wednesday night at 6.30 in the evening Central Standard Time. And people are watching us all over the world. So I like to introduce myself each time in case we got some new watchers. I'm teaching about the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is a broad uh, thing. It's not something that's simple. It, it is simple, but it's very intricate. I've got a title on the board. Preachers are lying. They're lying everywhere, all over America. I sit in my den, and I think of things and I sit down and write. I've got all kinds of things written on papers. And I just sit and write. And I wrote, the mark of the beast, when you look it up in a strong concordance, the Bible says that the concordance says it is the word charagma, C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. -A -A. Charagma. And it is a form of C H. A R A K T E R, character. I saw that word character and I thought, I wonder if that's where we get the word character. And I looked up character in a Webster's dictionary. What you need is a Webster's New World Dictionary, and you've always got the origin of the words in that. Well, the origin of the word character is character, C H A. R-A-K-T-E-R. -E and both of these words, the, your concordance will tell you it comes from karax, C-H-A-R-A-X. And karax means a stake, like a stake on a boundary line. That's what the mark of the beast is about. It's about the stake, and that started in the garden. I keep saying this every time when I'm talking about this. In the garden, there was an imaginary stake. It was God's stake. He's told Adam, you can eat of all these trees in the garden, but you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden you kind of need of this tree. I believe, always make it in the form of a Christmas tree because I believe that's what it was. And you cannot eat of that tree right there. And there was a stake. You can't go along the, um, you can't break the boundary line. And that is the where we get the word sin or iniquity. 
I put this on the board because I want you to get this in your head. Iniquity. And I Q U I T Y. Iniquity. Sin is the word hamartia. H A R M A R T I A. Hamartia is a construction of of uh, meros. Meros with the alpha primitive. The alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. There's no H's in the Greek. There's a diacritical mark. But this amartia, hamartia, sin, that is a construction of meros and the alpha primitive. Meros means a portion to eat of. Portion to eat of. Eat of. The alpha primitive negates as a negative particle and negates the following word. It means no portion to eat of. That's where it started was in the garden. You can't eat of that tree. There's a stake on the boundary line, a carox. God says, do not go beyond the stake. Iniquity has basically the same meaning. It is the word anomia in the Greek. Anomia. Anomia is, comes from the word nomos, N-O-M-O-S. That is the word law in the Greek. And as the word law, it means legally prescribed food for animals. In our case, sheep. We're, this is legally prescribed food. Prescribed food for sheep. And the alpha primitive does the same thing on the front of nomas. It negates the word. It means no food for sheep. That's like that's like two witnesses. And two witnesses what tell you what is legally right and wrong. No, no food. That is against the law to eat of. And what Eve saw in the tree. She saw a tree that was good for food, it was pleasant to the eye, and it would make her wise. That's the same three things that John calls all that is in the world. That is in the world. And all that's in the world, in 1 John 2.16, he says that, 2.16, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh is good for food. The lust of the eye is pleasant to the eye. Lust is the word epithumia. means to long for that which is forbidden. That's forbidden, the tree. Lust of the eye and the, the lust of the eye, epithumia. And lust of the eye has to do with idolatry, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. That's the word idolatry, and the Bible says covetousness is idolatry, Ido latruo, L-A-T-R-E-U-O, means to serve what you see, what you put into your eyes and your ears, means to serve what you see, and covetousness is idolatry. And it was a tree that would make her wise, and she could be proud of herself, proud. Pride of life. Pride of life is the word A-L-A-Z-O-N-I-A, and that is the word self-esteem. That's what she could have. This is everything that you can think of that's in the world that you will lust after. I don't care if it's a woman or a man or a car or a house or money or stuff or a better job. It's all encapsulated in these three things. That's what's in the tree. And that was beyond the stake or the character of Satan was to deceive Deceive is one of the most wicked words in the Bible. Deception. I believe the mark of the beast will be here, and I believe it's already here.
I believe we're building up to a world system. I sit around the house a lot of times just sitting in the den thinking about these things and I write these things. When I looked up Mark of the Beast or Mark in the concordance, it says, it says, character. It comes from character or character. The character of Satan, the it gives you this it gives you this definition in Webster's Dictionary, distinctive quality. So the mark of the beast is going to be the distinctive quality of the beast. Distinctive quality. Let me read you something I just wrote. The distinctive quality or mark of the beast is deception. Deception is fooling people, making them feel good by causing them to think you are telling them the truth while you are lying to them by making them feel good about the con that you are putting on them, promising them the moon while you are stealing them blind. And Satan was stealing the souls of Adam and Eve in the garden. I don't believe he got the souls. I said, and I thought of this the other day. When the love of money is the root of all evil, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what you find over in First Timothy, the sixth chapter. Love of money is the word philogoria, P H I L A R G U R I A. That is the root of all, all evil, including the mark of the beast. Philogoria comes from philos. Have you noticed something? Have you noticed that the mark of the beast is only deceptive to human beings? Just to humans, that's all it's for. And the thing that is in human beings that wants to pull them away from God is this, the flesh. That's it. That's all the evil there is in the world is your lust of the flesh. If there's no people, there would be no evil, would there? Wouldn't be. Root of all evil and love of money is philogoria. That's the love of money, love. It's one word in the Greek of money, one word, it's one word, philogria. It's a construction of philos and A-R-G-U-R-I-A, augeria. Philos means an affection for, it comes from the word phileo, Phile affection or to like. It comes from P H I L E O, phileo. That's one of the words that's been translated L O V E, and the other word is agape. These two words have been translated into one word. They're not the same word. Agape, or they've been translated into L O V E. L-O-V-E in the King James Bible. They're not the same word. This one means affection. This agape means the relationship that kings had for their subjects and God has for his family. This is love. This is agape that would walk after his commandments. How many times have I put on the board? But nearly every time I get up. There's nothing as evil as the love of money. That's what gets all over men. Augury means shining, means silver. Or shining. When a man wants to shine above others, he has a love of money. I know all about that. I was in the music business. There's no feeling, there's no drug like standing on a stage before a thousand or two thousand people and hearing the applause. It's a drug you cannot even imagine. You say, I've got to do this more. It's the worst drug I've ever taken, and I have taken some others. Augury means a love of shining or silver. 
It means you want to shine. And the Bible says, God resisteth the proud, resisteth antitasomai, N-T-I-T-A-S-S-O, M-A-I, means to wage war with. God wages war with the proud. Proud is the word huperephanos. H-U-P-E-R, H-U-P-E-R, Hoopere, P-H-A-I-N-O-S, P-H-A-N-O-S. And it comes from two words, Hooper, and Phanos, P-H-A-I-N-O-S. Phanos means to shine, we get the word Foss from that. Foss is the word light. People like the light. They like to have the spotlight on them in life. And this word hooper means above. When you want to be above everybody else and shine above everybody, God's at war with you. Boy, that takes a lot. Let me finish reading this thing I wrote. When the love of money is the root of all evil, then the, then the mark of the beast must be involved with the love of money. The beast is going to have to appeal to man's desire for his flesh with this mark or this character. That's the whole purpose of the mark of the beast is to seduce people, is to seduce is to deceive. It never has changed from the garden. It's always been here. The only thing is it's become an international thing. How can, how can everybody receive the mark of the beast? Well, they have it in their flesh. They have it in their flesh to desire to fulfill self. It's here. It's in us right now. It's in this outer man. The, the outer man is what the mark will appeal to. This will not be an evil-looking thing to man. It can't be. It has to look good to all the human race. Let me, let me show you something real quick. Look over here at... at how could it be evil when Matthew 24 says, For then shall be great tribulation such as not since the beginning known or ever shall be. And he goes on to say that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect if it were possible. If it's possible, how could it deceive the very elect if it wasn't real appealing to the human being? That's the whole point. It has to be appealing to everybody. It will look and sound good to the outer man. It will be enchanting. That's what the word serpent means. Serpent. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field when it came up to Eve. Serpent is the word nakash. Nakash means to enchant. That's not the normal word serpent. That's another word. Nakash means to enchant or whisper. It's going to be a soft, easy sound. That's what people are not looking for. They're looking for a fire-breathing dragon. It will be enchanting and fascinating. Remember the word dragon over in Revelation, the 13th chapter, dragon, dracon. Dracon means to fascinate. It will be fascinating. It will be enchanting. I like what one writer said. Enchant means to kill with the eye. That's what idolatry is. It means to, to, it, idolatry means to serve what you see and put into your eyes and ears. It will be a good words and fair speeches. Good words is crystal logia. 
Cresto. This is Romans 16, 17. Cresto. L-O-G-I. It means plausible. It sounds good. This is why the Christian's not going to be looking for it. It's going to sound as good as anything. But that's what the preachers are preaching today with their lies. It sounds good. When they tell you, all you have to do is send your money to me and God will restore it a hundredfold to you and you will be rich. All these preachers that are saying that are a bunch of liars. Joel Osteen is a magnificent liar. So is Kenneth Copeland. Jesse Duplantis. I call him Jesse the plant because that's about the IQ of his God. So is Frederick K.C. Price died about a month or two ago. And him believe he's in hell today. I don't believe he is any way he could possibly have gone to heaven. You cannot repent. You cannot be rich. What do you that are rich? You have your consolation. Good words, plausible. It means Christos, usable, logos. It's by good words and fair speeches. Fair speeches is the word eulogia, E-U-L-O-G-I-A. We got our word eulogy from that. It means to say real pleasant words that you don't mean. It will be good words and fair speeches that fascinate. It will be good words and fair speeches that appeals to the flesh, it will be so convincing that it will deceive the very elect if it were possible. There in Matthew, the 24th chapter. The mark of the beast is not some unusual evil that hasn't already been introduced into the world. There's nothing as evil as man's flesh. Nothing. There's nothing as evil as man's heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. The heart of man is deceitful above everything that ever existed. Who can know it? The heart, boy, people, the world doesn't want to hear all this. The mark of the beast is a lie that seduces the flesh. The seduction of the serpent in the garden do you realize what the seduction of the serpent in the garden brought about? The death of all humanity. As the Bible says, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. That's what it did. It's What I want to do is read to you some of the things that the Bible says liars will suffer from. I'm going to go into some of these. In Proverbs 14 and 5. 14 and 5. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. If a man is a false witness, that's what... Copeland and company, that's what Jesse Duplantis, that's what uh, the guy in Houston, the guy that he didn't even deserve a name. I was watching him on the TV and he just smiles all the time and tells you what a great time you're going to have being a believer. And a Korean Christian is wonderful. He doesn't tell you. Those guys will never tell you that you have to go through tribulation. Have you ever noticed they never talk about tribulation and trials and persecution? They never talk about the narrow way. The narrow way is the gospel. See, nobody ever defines the gospel. The beginning of the gospel is, was written in the prophets, is prepare you the way. And the way is narrow. There's two ways. This is the gospel. People say, 
You never talk about the gospel. Yes, I do. I talk about the narrow way. And the Bible says that the beginning of the gospel is prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The gospel is the narrow way. And the beginning of it, you just begin to get into the gospel when you're in the narrow, the Thalibo, T-H-L-I-B-O, the Thalibo way. And Thalibo means to be pressured on all sides by people when you tell them Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan. I know that you can't do that when you're young, when you first start out. I'll tell you what you do. You fill your mind full of these verses and through these Greek words. And when you get around people, you can't keep your mouth shut. I can't keep my mouth shut. I hear somebody talking about the color of the flowers in their flower bed or their wallpaper or the vacation they're going on. And if they say one thing, they open the door for me, I'll go, Psh. I'll just jump in right on top of them. And I won't be mean, I won't be hard. I'll just say, well, did you know that, did you know that, uh, they we be talking about Christmas. I said, did y'all know that uh, Christmas is paganism that was against the law to celebrate it 300 years ago in America? I'll say it just like that. Did you know it was against the law to celebrate it? And they'll go, Look at me real cockeyed. Like, what are you talking about? Or if I get a chance, I'll say, God does not love everybody. Did you know that? And they'll go, what? I've decided I'm going to have a T-shirt made. I had, a t I had several T-shirts made that said, God loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born for either one had done any good or evil. I've found that we people in passing, if you got too much on your shirt, they can't read it. I'm just going to put God loved Jacob and hated Esau, period. I'm going to start doing that to some of my shirts. God loved Jacob and hated Esau. I'm not going to put the rest of it with the Bible verse. That'll, that'll maybe provoke somebody to give me a hard time. God loved Jacob and Eddie, so. Or just put Christmas pagan. A Christmas is Roman Catholic. I've got one shirt that says Christmas is Roman Catholicism, and then it says in parentheses, I'm not a Roman Catholic. You do that, and people will go, what? I got one shirt that I got on the elevator one day. I used to have it. I think I gave it to Dave. But it says, uh, Jesus hates Christmas and then in parentheses I got Jesus loves me and on the back I've got I hate Christmas but Jesus I love Jesus and the woman went what are you talking about Christmas Jesus hates Christmas and then I go into it and tell her I try to provoke people into asking me something now let's get back to this let me go into some of these things about liars, what God will do to liars. Look here in Proverbs 14 and 3. 14 and, excuse me, 5. 14 and 5. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Scorner is the word lutes, L-U-W-T-S. L-U-W-T-S. It, it, what, it, what it is, Lutz means a man that interprets the Bible for himself. He's, he's, he's a man that's got his own opinion. It's his free will. And he findeth not, but knowledge is easy unto him that is unto him that understandeth. It's easy for us. Look here in Proverbs 14 and 25. Proverbs 14, 25. 25 says, The crown of the wise and their rich... That's four. Read 24 and 25. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A true witness delivereth souls... But a deceitful witness, deceit is what Satan used on Eve. Witness speaketh lies. Look over here in Proverbs 19, 5 and 9. Proverbs 19, 
five. 19.5 A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness is one that speaks lies. That's what, that's what those guys are, those charismatics. That's even what the Baptists are. A false witness, in verse 9, shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish all you charismatics, that guy in Houston is just a maniac. I, he gets on TV and he tries to just talk real, just real nice and, and just smiles real big and says, you're going to be great and you're going to be wonderful. All you got to do is send me your money. You're going to die in your sin and go to hell, Master. Look over here in Proverbs 30 and 8. Joel Osteen is corrupt to the core. Proverbs 30 and 8. Proverbs 30 and verse 8. Verse 8. Well, let me read 6, 7, and 8, maybe 9. Add thou not unto the words, unto God's words, that's what they've done. They've added to his words and subtracted from his words. Lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. If you add, if you change the meaning of God's words, you've added to his words. I guess the main verse that all these charismatics and Pentecostals go after, particularly the charismatics, is 3 John 2. They have changed the meaning of the words. They've corrupted it. Where that John says, I wish above all things. Above all things. You think God wishes above all things that you would have money and physical health? Not on your life. That's not it. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Even as thy soul prospers, the same way your soul prospers, that's the way I want you to prosper. Prosper and be in health. Prosper is not our word prosper. Absolutely not. And every one of those charismatics use it to mean money. But they say that what John means here is he wants you to have a lot of money by sending us your money. No, that makes you rich, you liar and cheat. Joel Osteen, he is a liar above all liars on the TV. He's got the largest congregation in America. He runs 30,000 on Sunday morning. He's lying and cheating all those people in his congregation. Prosper is the word U-E-U-O-D-O-O. -O -O. That is the word when you look it up in a strong concordance, prosper. It's funny how all these words keep running into each other because this is going to run into the gospel. This will run right into it. It means it comes from you, meaning well, and hadas, H-O-D-O-S. There we are, back to the gospel. What he's wishing for you is the well, and I said this to one fellow the other day, I said, you come from, it's the same word as E-U-L-O-G-Y. You go to a funeral to say a eulogy over a man that's in the casket and say good words and fair speeches that you don't even mean. You don't have any right to say it. You say a eulogy. You means well or good. And there we are, back to the gospel. Hodos, way, the well way. There's two ways, a narrow way and a broad way. And the way of Christ, the beginning of the gospel, I'm going to keep saying this, beginning of the gospel, of gospel, is prepare ye the way. Prepare way. Prepare you the way. The way is narrow. Narrow is the word to leave. I already put this on the board for you. 
T-H-L-I-B-O. And it comes from the, that's the noun form. And the verb form is T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. And thalipsis is the common word every time you find tribulation in the Bible. When Paul said, we must have, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. You cannot enter heaven without tribulation somewhere in your life. You have to be persecuted for what you believe about the truth. Just tell somebody about Christmas, you'll get persecution. Tell them Easter is Ishtar. It's Easter was a, was a goddess of the Saxons. Tell them that. That they did not celebrate Jesus' resurrection once a year in the early church. They celebrated every first day of the week, Sunday, because that's the day he rose from the dead. They celebrated it every Sunday. What's the first day of the week? What is the once a year? That's Ishtar. We get the word Easter from that. Or Ashtar. Or Aster. That's the word star in the Greek. That's the worship of the stars. Or the grove. Asherah. Those are all forms of the same word. The grove is what God scattered Israel for, for worshiping Baal in the grove for 500 years as they were a kingdom. That's the same thing that was brought to the church and renamed the Christ Mass. And the beginning of the gospel is prepare you the way. That is a, Paul, Jesus said in the world you shall have tribulation, but I have overcome Overcome the world. Overcome is the word nik, N-I-K-A-O. And it's a, that is the verb form of N-I-K-E, which is victory. That's the noun. That's the noun form of nikao being the verb. And this is the, this is the victory. That's the word nike. And faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is death to self. That's not what these guys are preaching. Death to self. Now, let me read some more of these sufferings that you have to go through. And, and these, look at Proverbs 30 and 8. 30 and 8. I don't know if I read that to you yet. Remove from me, or he says, add not unto the words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found to be a liar. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me, deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Keep liars away from me, God. Give me neither poverty nor riches feed me with food convenient for me it, the word convenient means appointed it's appointed for me lest I be full and deny thee and say who is the Lord or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of God in vain I'm going to show you something here this is just unbelievable what they say. The charismatics are the lyingest, crookedest bunch of people. I don't like charismatic doctrine. I don't like tongues. There's no such thing as Pentecostal tongues. They have rinsed those chapters and those verses. There's two words for tongue. What they've done, they've twisted them just like they've twisted prosper, the well way. The well way is tribulation, is persecution, it is the gospel. That's the well way. And then it turns around and says, prosper and be in health, H-E-A-L-T-H. Even as thy soul prospers. Health is the word hugiano, H-U-G-I-A-I-N-O. Hugiano is the same word that Paul would use when it says the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. 
Sound is the word hugiano. Health in Third John 2 is hugiano. It means uncorrupt words. So what John is saying, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper in the well hodos gospel way through tribulation, and I will overcome this tribulation by faith in your life, and that you will be in health with uncorrupt words. It has nothing, zero to do with what, what those guys say, with what Kenneth Copeland says, with what that bird brain in Houston says. It has nothing to do with that. It's nothing. They have corrupted the word of God. That's what Satan did in the garden. Let me look at some more of these on lying. Look over here in, in look in, uh, in Isaiah, the 28th chapter. Isaiah 28, verse 15 and 17. 15. Let's read 14, 15, and 17. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful, you men that have made up your own decision, that rule this people, that rule Israel. He's not talking to pagans. He's talking to Israelites, their kings and their priests. They've corrupted Israel. People, when they read this, they don't know that's what he's talking to. He's talking to a God's people that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. Who else would he be talking to except Israelites? Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell. Are we in agreement? When the overflowing scourge, which is a Assyria, is going to come down and crush them, shall pass through, it shall come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge. They have hid in lies like in a cave, and lies is their protection. That's what Joel Osteen's got. He's got lies as his protection. The guys, anybody that talks as nice as he talks, don't ever believe them. Praise God, I just love Jesus. You just love Jesus all your heart, isn't he wonderful? And aren't you wonderful? And God will make you life wonderful, and you'll have lots of money if you'll send it to me. What a, what a downright, low-down skunk he is. He is a lying crook. If I believe that, I would go to Calcutta, India, where there's a million people lying in the streets say, everybody here just be positive and say it with your mouth. And you'll have a new car in a week. Um, there'll be a million Cadillacs on the streets here. Just a stupid man. And he doesn't even know he's stupid. Under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And then he says in verse 17, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. A plummet was a plumb line. He said, I'm going to measure out judgment to people who lie. And the hail shall sweep over the refuge of lies and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. He's talking about the armies of the Assyrians coming in and flowing over Israel for Israel's lies. Let me give you a couple more of these. Let me go to one of my favorites here. Go over to the 20th, 23rd chapter. I've got a bunch of them here, but the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah. This is one of my favorite chapters. I'm going to skip some of them because I just don't have time. 23rd chapter of Jeremiah is one of my favorite books. Jeremiah is my favorite prophet, and this is one of my favorite chapters in all the prophets. He says here, Woe unto the pastors that feed, that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Pastor and shepherd are the same word in the Hebrew. Same word. Saith the Lord. And then he goes all through here and condemns them. 
And he says down here in verse 14, I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem. He's not talking about prophets of Moab or prophets of Ammon. He's talking about Jerusalem prophets that are supposed to be righteous. I've seen in the prophets of Jerusalem. I might ought to read that 13th verse. Let me read that first. And I've seen folly in the prophets of Samaria, northern Israel. And they prophesied in Baal and caused my people to, of Israel to err. And I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. Adultery, God calls that adultery when they go after other gods. He says, he calls them continually. They, he said, these are your lovers. He called Baal the grove, Shemash, Bolak, the lovers of Israel, while they committed adultery and fornication against God. And yet walk in lies and strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. Israel will not turn and I keep bringing judgment on them. I told you I'd bring the sword, the famine, the pestilence. I do that over and over and over and then I'll bring the beast, Babylon, and Persia, Greece, and Rome to carry you away into captivity. Because you keep going after your lies, just like America, just like the preachers in America. Preachers in America, are they're destroying the American system. They're doing it. Why do the politicians lie in Washington? Because they, nobody hears it in the churches across America. We're living in the apostasy. I keep saying that. I hope you can get that in your heads. Second Thessalonians. One and three. The day of the Lord, the day when he comes back in flaming fire from chapter one of Second Thessalonians. The, the day of the Lord will not come until there come a falling away first. Falling away is apostasis. That's the word falling away. Falling away is one word in the Greek. In the Greek text, apostasis, it's, it's, a, it's a construction of apo and stasis. Apo means a removal. And stasis means to stand upright. There's something called morphemes in the Greek language. I've said this many times. That's word shapes that come from this same word. The word staros is the word cross. There has been a removal of the daily cross in our society. Preachers don't tell people they have to have a daily cross. It has been removed from the pulpits of America. You have to know what a cross is. A cross was a punishment for doing evil. In the first century, only, only criminals and slaves could go to a cross. If you were a Roman citizen, you couldn't suffer the cross. A cross was very, very hard. It was something that nobody wanted to die on because it lasted sometimes for a week or two. They would try to keep a man alive. They weren't going to keep Jesus alive because he couldn't stay on a cross on the Sabbath to the Jews. They took him down. But you had to be condemned to it. They took a man and they would put him on a stipes the word cross is the word stake but it wasn't a stake like people think there was a, two parts to a cross there was the upright part that they went and buried in the ground the Jews found out they had to bury that in the ground beforehand and they had a little notch up here and they had a footstool down here the footstool had a purpose. It wasn't to comfort the man. It was so it could breathe. 
Well, they had a little notch. That was called the stipes. Then they had the cross piece that had the man bear that. Maybe you've seen that in movies or in news. They would put the put the the cross piece, which was called patibulum. The patibulum, or it's U M, I believe. The patibulum. They would put it on a man's shoulders and he would hold it like this. And then he would walk. It would be very heavy. That's why Jesus fell under it and Simon the Cyrenian was compelled to bear his cross. It was the cross piece. And he had bear it up to the place where he was going to be crucified. They would nail, they would nail the nails between the radius and the ulna. These two bones here are the radius and the ulna. I learned that from biology in high school. They drive it through here. They didn't drive it through the palm of the hand. If they did, if they drove it through the palm, they'd have broken bones. And the, the Passover lamb, no bone could be broken. Otherwise, it did not meet the criteria of the Passover lamb. So when you see somebody that's got stigmata and they're bleeding at the hands, that's wrong. <laughs> they're lying because that's not true. It had, in fact, we had a picture of the Jesus with those. It was over in the water. I don't think we got any more. But it's the nails went through here, and then they put them through his feet where they could nail it to the cross, and that he would sit on that cross. And then they would take him and they would twist that cross piece backwards. Would it throw his body forward and he'd be out of joint because the Passover lamb had to be disjointed. So when he was on this cross piece and he was out of joint, he could inhale but he could not exhale unless he pushed up on his feet on that little foot foot stool there, unless he pushed up. So when he pushed up, he could breathe out. Otherwise, he'd suffocate. And he was compelled to push up on that. And in order to keep living, he'd keep pushing up on that foot piece there in order to keep living. Sometimes other men that were crucified, there were 6,000 crucified on the Appian Way. The Appian Way was the road to Rome. And there were 6,000 6, crucified during the rebellion of Spartacus. That was around 60, 65 B.C. And there were 6,000 of those rebelling uh, uh, guys out of the prison that were crucified on crosses. So, so that's the whole point. When he was, he couldn't breathe unless he pushed up. But the more he pushed up, the longer he died. It took to die. And the cross was a terrible, horrible thing. But before Jesus went to the cross, he was beaten with a, with a with a uh, whip. It was called the cat of nine tails. It had nine leather strips. Nine leather strips and pieces of glass and bone all in it. And most men could not could not handle just being beaten with the whip. But those guys were such so efficient in their ability that they could rip the hide off of your back and you could see the inner workings of the of the guts inside the intestines inside as they pulled it off they just whip him and they could just literally remove the hide and Jesus went through that and he went to the cross besides but that's not what was that's not what was so frightening to Jesus when he said my god my god why hast thou forsaken me he wasn't talking about the cross. When he said, if it be thy will, let the let this cup pass from me. He's not talking about him crucified on the cross because many men had been crucified before him. 
He was talking about at the moment that he died, he took upon himself all the sins of all mankind that were elect. And what he did, he was saying, Father, if it be thy will that this cup of taking all this sin upon me, he took of himself all the sin and all the shame that you've ever felt if you're a believer. Have you ever felt any shame for what you did? He took that shame upon him. He took that, that sin upon him and felt all that all at once of all the elect, all the predestinated elect of all time. Whew. That's a lot to suffer. That's what he was talking about. If, you, if it be thy will that this cup pass me. He wasn't talking about dying on a cross. Anybody could do that. Many had done it. He was talking about God. He had never called his father God before or since. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's why. But anyway, that's what the cross is about. So there has to be a falling away, a removal of the daily cross in our lives. How do you get a cross? By telling people the truth. The daily cross, people have got the cross mixed up with, uh, they've got it mixed up with being behind, on, being behind on their car payment or their house payment. That's not it. But do you think Paul had a house payment or a car payment or a camel payment? No. He was being chased all over the world. They were trying to kill him for what he was saying. Jesus died for his words. Stephen died because he looked at the Pharisees and said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. Boy, they said, we'll kill you for that. They gritted their teeth together and said, you could say that to us. So they killed him. They killed Peter and crucified him upside down for his words. Our words is what's going to get a cross for us. You say, what do you mean a cross? Will they literally put me down on the ground? No, they will. You'll suffer a spiritual death when you start witnessing about the real truth. Death is the word thanatos, T-H-A-N-A-T-O-S. It does not mean annihilation. Annihilation would be death, would be, when you think of death, you think of somebody killing this body. That's not what it is. It's separation. When, they, when you tell somebody about Christmas and they've been a good friend to you, they've been a good friend and been an associate of yours for some years, and you tell them about Christmas and tell them about predestination, the next time they see you out in public, they say, oh, uh, uh, good to see you, Zach, but I don't have time to talk now. i got to run. They're going to separate from you. And is that sad? Oh, yeah, it's very weary. i got to thinking, I can't get anybody in my past to talk to me. Not even my sister or my pagan brother. He's a pagan because he's a charismatic. I can't get any of them to talk to me. I can't, I don't have anybody in my past, no one, all the music people I knew, all the guys that were in my band, none of them will talk to me. Nobody. Because they don't like, well, my brother, my younger brother, he just got upset at me because I, I corrected him and rebuked him for sin, and he called me a damned fool for what I was preaching, for, what I, for the stand that I take. He doesn't know that the preaching of the daily cross is to them that perish foolishness. I believe my brother is perishing in his sin. I believe he will be in hell one day if God doesn't cause him to repent. And he's just about eight years younger than me. I don't believe he's going to repent in his mid-70s. Now, I want to go over here. I want us to look here at the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah, verse 14. 
I have seen also the prophets in Jerusalem and horrible thing, and they commit adultery with other gods and walk in lies and strengthen also the hands of the evildoers that none doeth, doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. He's talking about Israel is as Sodom and Gomorrah. These people who are supposed to be believers are as Sodom and Gomorrah. And look down at verse 23. Look at 20, uh, 25. 25. I have heard that the prophet said, they prophesy in Jerusalem, these believing Jews prophesy lies in my name. It reminds me of a bunch of charismatics and Baptists that they're saying these things in the name of Christ. In Jesus' name we say these things. And he says, I have not spoken this, what they're saying. Saying I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Dreams don't mean nothing. If they do, i got the wildest dreams of anybody you've ever seen. I dream about being on stage. I dream about somebody's introducing me and I can't find my pants. <laughs> and I'm just trying to, or I can find my pants and I can't get them on. Or I, I'm standing in front of a big congregation and I'm supposed to be preaching. I can't think of anything to say. I can't think of nothing. I think, what am I going to say to these people? How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies like Kenneth Copeland, like Jesse Duplantis, like Creflo Dollar? You guys are lying. Like that bird brain in Houston. Yea, they are prophets of deceit. Notice it's all about deceiving. When people deceive you, they tell you things that they think you want to hear so they can get something from you or out of you. And look down here in verse 26. Yea, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart. And down here in verse 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. I like that word, lightness. Pagaza. P A C H A. P A. C H A. Z U W T H. It means light, unimportant things. I listen to Baptist preachers and they bore me out of my mind. They don't give you any information, they don't tell you anything, what anything means. The Baptist have added to the word of God. You cannot add to my word, God says. You cannot s subtract from it. If you do, you're going to be found to be a liar, you Baptist preachers. I was raised in a Baptist preacher's home. I was ordained in a Southern Baptist church, and I know what the Baptists think. They preach two things that have changed the word of God. They, were, they have been froward. Every time you find the word froward, it means to twist or pervert. The Baptists have perverted the way of salvation. I, had this, I got this shirt. I just had it made. And it says, I'm waiting for Jesus to come and get me out of this insane world. And right under that, in little smaller letters, not small, it says, preachers and politicians are lying. I walked into a hearing aid place the other day to have my hearing aids adjusted. 
And this older woman in her 60s, probably not as old as me, but in her 60s, she said, what do you mean preachers are lying? I said, well, that's a good question. I said, first of all, I said, the Baptists are saying that you have to accept Christ as your personal Savior to go to heaven. And that's not true. The Bible says it isn't true. And they preach the sinner's prayer for salvation. And I said, and she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, they... They quote Romans ten thirteen for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, that's true, but that's not the method of salvation. Read the next verse. The next verse says, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? If you ever call upon God sincerely, you're already a believer. It's belief that saves you. That's what Paul told the Philippian jailer when there was an earthquake at, at midnight one night and there in Acts the 16th chapter and the Philippian jailer came and fell down his feet and said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, he didn't say, would you like to pray this prayer and mean it with all your heart? Would you like to accept Christ as your personal Savior? He didn't say that. He didn't say, pray this prayer and mean it. Would you let Jesus come into your heart? He didn't say that either. You can't, when you're dead in sin, you can't let God do anything. And you can't call on him when you don't believe in him. Belief is the method of salvation. Believe. Believe is a verb. A verb shows action. That's a verb. The, that's the verb form of faith, and faith is the noun. Faith is the word. Faith is the noun. I put it. I put it right above believe. Faith is the noun. In the Greek, you'll have a lot of times you'll have a noun. You'll have a noun and a verb form of it. Faith is the word p i s t i s. Believe is the word p i s t e u o. Pistuo, P-I-S-T, is the stem of the word with a basic meaning in it. That's the stem. This is the verb. Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe Jesus, you, you do what he says. Do what he says. You'll read the Bible and you'll believe it if he says, strive to enter into the straight gate. Strive, it doesn't mean try. You'll get your concordance out and you'll look and it'll say agonizomai, A-G-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. That's our word agonize. Strive to enter in at the straight, S-T-R-A-I-T. Straight, straight. Straight is the word, is the word stenos. And every time you find the word groan over there in Romans, the eighth chapter, groan is the, is the verb form of straight, the noun. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Groan is the word stenazo, S-T-E-N-A-Z-O. And that is the verb form of stenos, the straight gate. We're in a groaning as we go through this agonizing what we're agonizing over is that outer man that is going, we're going against our outer man that wants to serve the law of the flesh and we're, we're serving the law of the inner man that's Christ in you, the new birth. You're going to have to come to a place. When you're young, you don't come to that place easy. I'm sorry, but it don't happen real easy. When you get old... You've been down to the pit and you felt the flames of hell burning at you. You say, Phew. God, you have beat me to death in my life. I can't, I sat down with, with uh, one of the guys one night and I went through the whole story of my life. He said, man, you've been through a lot. I said, yeah. I went through snowstorms, blizzards, years in the music business where there a bunch of thieves and crooks and liars. It don't matter what business it is in America, anybody that's popular in the world, I don't care what singer it is, won't you when all men speak well of you? If they like Taylor Swift, 
There's a cry of damnation against that girl. You cannot be popular in the world and be a godly believer. You just can't. She's young. She's just a kid to me. She's just a girl. She's not a woman. She's just a girl. Because I got a daughter that's 60, be 64 here in August. Got a daughter. And my daughter don't believe in much of anything. Of course, Taylor Swift don't either. Neither does Carrie Underwood. Carrie Underwood calls herself a Christian, but she believes in 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 same marriage, men marrying men, women marrying women. She said she got saved in a Southern Baptist church when she's seven or eight, but she gets up there and strips all her clothes off for Monday for Sunday night football and wiggles her tail in and looks like, oh, she looks great and sings great, but she calls herself a Christian. You can't be a Christian, carry and dress like that and stand in front of the world and say, hey, look at my body. Listen to me sing great. God resists the proud. He's making war with you, Carrie. If, if, you, if he doesn't deal with your heart, you'll die and go to hell one day. Do I believe she's saved? No, I don't believe that. Not at all. I don't care what she says about getting saved when she's a kid. She might be, but God might have to break her neck or her back and make her paraplegic or quadriplegic to get her attention. God will do anything he has to do to get your attention. Now, let me get back to this. I don't believe in the Baptists that say you have to pray the sinner's prayer. The blind man in John 9, 31, he said that, that Jesus had healed. He said, we know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. You have to be worshiping God and doing the will of God before he can hear you. You can't be a dead sinner and pray to God and have him hear you. It can't be. It's just not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't heal people just because you want him to. I don't believe in the Baptists that come up and say, they come up and say, you have to accept Christ as your personal Savior. When you're dead in sin, you can't accept anything spiritual. The Bible says so, you bunch of Baptists. You're dead. What can you do when you're dead? Nothing spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.14 They have added to the Word of God. If you add to the Word of God, you're going to be found to be a liar, all you Baptist preachers. Adrian Rogers, who used to pastor the second largest church in the Southern Baptist Convention, Bellevue Baptist Church, he said he hated predestination. How can you hate something that's in the Bible and you pastor a big Baptist church? How can you hate it? You can't. I don't like Adrian Rogers. I don't know if he went to heaven. He's dead now. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man, this is for Baptists more than anybody else. Because they say you have to accept Christ as your personal Savior when you're dead in sin. You can't. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Natural. Sukikos. P-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S. Sukikos is our word physical. It's... It's our word physical. It means the sensual man. What do you mean sensual? The man that has senses. He can smell. He can hear. He can taste. He can touch. He can feel. That man doesn't receive anything spiritual. Receive is the word dekomai. Dekomai comes from the word deck. Now this is the word receiveth. Receiveth. 
The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is truth. So the Bible says he cannot receive truth because they're foolishness to him. Foolish, foolish is the word M-O-R-A-I-N-O. Moreno. We get our word moron from that. Anybody who talks about accepting Christ, you could accept Christ after you're a believer. But you can't do it before you're a believer while you're dead in sin. The Bible says so. This is one of the Baptists. I know what you Baptists preach. I preach in Baptist churches all over America. I was raised in a Baptist preacher's home. My father said this every service. Won't you walk the aisle and accept Christ as your personal Savior and pray this prayer and you're home free. You're saved. No, you're not. Not unless God births you by his will of his own will begat he us. We were born again, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God's will. If you're born again, God had to pick you out before the foundation of the world and cut into your heart and cause you to believe. That's the only thing. That, that's the only way you get there. I don't care what people say. I'm going with the Bible and I'm voting against thousands of Baptist preachers across America because they're going to tell you this and that's not true. They're going to tell you the sinner's prayer and that's not true. You have to be born by the will of God. I don't understand that. You have to believe, but you can't believe because you, you're dead. Well, how dead is how dead is dead? Well, it's dead. That's it. When you're a sinner and you're dead, God has to pick you out before the foundation of the world. He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. He didn't just choose to go to heaven. He chose us to be holy and without blame. Holy, without blame, before Him in love, without blame. Holy is the word hagios, H-A-G-I-O-S. If you don't want to be holy, you don't have any hope of going to heaven. Hagios means to be pure. Pure comes about by fire, by trials, by a daily cross, by persecution. All of these things, when you have that outer man and that inner man, the outer man serves the law of the flesh, the inner man serves the law of God. And when you first come to truth, when you first come to truth, you have just an inner man and most of your world is about you. It's about the flesh. And this inner man starts working in you and puts fire and trial and cross in everything in your life. And as you grow older, the less of self you want. And you come to a place where you got a thin veneer of self. You still have it. It's still called sin. It's just a thin veneer. And then I've got a thin veneer of the flesh in me. I got sin in me. Not like I had when I was 30. No, absolutely not like I had when I was 25. Whew. I was hard to mess with back then as far as my sin was concerned. But I don't want to do the things that I wanted to do when I was young. It reminds me of Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not when you get old, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in the days of my youth anymore. I'm 84. I don't want to do the things I used to do. I don't want to go out on a ball field and play ball. I don't want to play football or basketball. I don't want to jump in a pool and swim. I don't want to do anything that I wanted to do back then because I'm old. And it's going to happen to everybody here. Age is going to get you before it's over. And so as you get older... And God puts you through fire and trial and persecution, all kinds of... He may put you through a bankruptcy. He may put you 
through loved ones dying and passing away. You think, how can I live uh, with all these problems? But he does that to get rid of this outer man. I don't like these preachers. Have y'all figured that out by now? I don't like any of the... I don't know of a preacher in America that will put this many Greek words on the board. None of them. And tell you what they mean. Because they don't mean what they're saying. The charismatics lie as fast as they talk. I guess I ought to show you one of the things they lie about. How much time do they have, Mike? Look over here at... They lie about everything. They say... What, get, what really gets me... All the faith healers die. They all die. And they, they, Oral Roberts is the most famous faith healer in the last 200 years in America. The most famous. And he believed he could be, he believed in faith healing. Well, Oral Roberts died in a hospital in California in one of the richest sections of America where he lived in a multi-million dollar home and he died in a hospital in California. Why did he die in a hospital? We could have called Benny Hinn and had him heal him, but he died of pneumonia. He could have phoned Benny Hinn in before he died and had him heal him. What insanity. And what is a faith healer doing? Building a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Why did that don't make any sense? Does it to you? It's stupid. He builds a hospital and he's a faith healer. He gets a bunch of people in a, in a, under a tent and says, be healed, be healed, be healed. And if you're not healed, you can go to my hospital. I can make some money out of you. It's just dumb. That's not the way Jesus healed. And Kenneth Hagin, who introduced this positive confession movement into America in the 30s, he had Hagen's Institute out there in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just down the street from Oral Roberts University. And he says he went to India and studied positive confession from those Indian gurus over there that don't believe in Jesus and they believe in Hinduism. He went over there and he got that, that positive confession. They said all you had to do was say things with your mouth and you get it. And you could go to a Hindu and you could lay down on, on these crystals and you'll, the crystals will heal you. You believe that? Don't believe that at all. And he brought it back to America. E.W. Kenyon brought it back to America. And Kenneth Hagin got a hold of it. He introduced it into the Pentecostal movement. And that start, took a hold, and Oral Roberts got of it, and they blew it up worldwide. Kenneth Hagin died of a heart attack in Oklahoma. What's he doing dying of a heart attack? Paul Crouch, who started TBN just up the street, who he started in Dallas, but we got a representative of it here. Paul Crouch, you can get all this off the Internet. Paul Crouch died... Uh, with congestive heart failure that he had wrestled with for 10 years. When he had been diagnosed with congestive heart failure, let's just say six months after he was diagnosed, why don't he call uh, Kenneth, call uh, one of these faith healers in, Benny Hinn, to come heal him? But he said, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. I need you to lay hands on me and heal me, okay? Why didn't he do that? But he didn't. He died. Frederick K.C. Price, who passed a huge church out in California, he died here just a couple of weeks ago. I don't know what y'all think he, why he died, because he believed that all he had to do was say it with his mouth and he got to live. They all die. They're, that's an insult to the rest of the world. Jan Krauss, that purple-haired wife of a because that's what she had, purple hair. She, she died of the heart attack coupled with a stroke. 
Why did she die? Because she was a charismatic. All, all her husband could lay hands on her, and he could lay hands on himself, and then lay hands on her, and they could both be healed. It's just idiocy. They all die, and Kenneth Copeland will die. He says he's going to live to be 120. Well, even if you do, you've got to die at 120. Do I believe he's going to live that long? No. I think God's going to send him to hell as soon as he can. Jesse Duplantis is going to die. They're all, they lie as fast as they talk. Look over here in, look here in Mark. I'm just going to correct them on one of their happenings. They say that this man received his healing. He didn't receive his healing. Look here. There's a man that's born of four. And in the second chapter of Mark. And they had to go. They couldn't get to Jesus They're because of the press. There was a great pressure in this house where Jesus was. They couldn't get in to see him, so they said uh, he was sick with a palsy. So they took him on the housetop and let him down through the roof. Well, if you read uh, Mr. Edersheim's book on the, the uh, sketches of the Jewish social life, it'll tell you that their houses were flat-topped. And that they had a staircase going up the side because they would dry all their they would dry their their wheat and their various things up here and they put the roofs on with these tiles. So what they did was pull up one of the tiles and let the man down through the house in the presence of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith. Here's what it says in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But they use this, the charismatics, to say he received his healing. He didn't do any such thing. But there were certain of the scribes. Scribes was the top line of the Pharisees. They were the doctors of the law. Sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? He was God. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves he said unto them them is referring back to the scribes he looks at the scribes and says to them hey you listen to me whether it's easier to to say to the sick thy sins be forgiven thee or arise take up thy bed and walk but that you scribes may know here's why I'm healing him it's for your information. He didn't do it because the man received anything. He looked at the scribe and said, that you may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. He turned to the sick of the palsy and said, you, sir, rise up and walk. He healed him to prove who he was to the scribes, not because of the man's faith. Can you see that? And all the charismatics say, he received his healing. He didn't receive nothing. Jesus healed him to prove who he was to the scribes. They were a bunch of liars. Just like that bird burned down in Houston. They lied. Those guys lied. And the Baptist preachers are lying today. They put a substitute in. I'm not saying everybody that walks the aisle and wants to accept Christ is an unbeliever, but that makes an excuse for a lot of people. All I have to do, men that are not really repentant and they're not being born again, they say, all I have to do is walk down that aisle in that Baptist church and say, I'm accepting Christ and I want to pray the prayer so I can be saved. And they walk away with a false assurance. There has to be a change of the heart, and that only comes from God. 
I don't like these preachers today. I don't like you guys. Some of you, I believe most of you, I don't believe most of those charismatics are bound for hell. I believe they're vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. That's who I believe they are. Don't believe they believe God at all. I'm about, about out of time, ain't I, Mike? How much time do I have? I don't have much time left. I was going to take you over to Romans, the fourth chapter. I like to take you through these things. Preachers are lying. Most of them that I hear, I try to listen to them on the radio, and I can't listen to them very long. I think, I can't listen to that. I'm going riding down the road with my radio on saying, that you, that you liar? No! And I'm screaming at my radio, and nobody can even hear me but me. I've done that a hundred times. I don't like the... You, when you add all this to the Word of God and it's not true, it makes the Bible boring. Especially when you don't believe, when you believe that you've got to send all your money to them to get, to get well or to get money or get riches. I've, I've had people call me and say, my mother sent all of her money to Kenneth Copeland and she's broke now and I don't know what to do. Kenneth Copeland, you're going to die in your sin and be in hell one day. When anybody that is a, is a uh, faith healer or charismatic and they die, I say, wonderful, good. I'm glad that one less of those liars are on the earth to pervert the truth of God's Word. I love the Word of God and I don't like what they do. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm out of time. Lord, thank you for the truth. Lord, help me to understand more and more this word. Help me to help the people to understand what's happening in the world, that we're in the middle of this mark of the beast. It's deception, Lord. It's like never before. I pray you'll fight our battles for us and help us to overcome everything that's, that we have to overcome. Faith is the victor that overcomes the world. Increase our faith, Lord, and we'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. I want to stay on this subject because I really believe that deception is the mark. That's the most evil thing it's, the Bible speaks of. Hey, Chip. How you doing? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That helps a lot. David, that's yours. <laughs> How you doing? Hanging in there. Huh? Thank you. I love you, Dave. We went and visited um, Lily today. Oh, did you? Yeah. How's she doing? Can she talk? Not really, but she did. She kind of did with us. She what? Oh, she did a little bit with us. Did a little bit of communication? Yeah. She was, she's in bad shape. I know she is. See her yesterday. Hey, what are you doing there, brother? Hey, I went to see Lily yesterday. Oh, did you? Yeah, boy. Boy, she's having a hard time, I know. She's got a breathing tube out this morning, I think. She what? I think she's got a breathing tube out this morning. She's, she should, if she gets up and around, she's going to have a tremendous lawsuit against that company. And she could be fixed for the rest of her life. I mean, there could be a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Huh? Well, if it was that guy's fault... Huh? 
She'd love to see you if you can get a ride. Yeah, I, if I can get out there, I'm going to. Yeah. I'm just, to I've been so tired lately. I'm just having a hard time getting around. I'll try to go back again, I guess. Huh? I'll probably try to go back again. Okay. Really lifts her spirits when she sees it. She's, is she conscious? Yes, yes, yes. She can't talk, though? She's very, she, don't even, she doesn't even look like Lily. She's just so swollen up. Really? Yeah. It's, it hurts. Well, it's well she's not supposed to be anything but swollen up. Because yeah, when you have, when you're in a wreck like that, yeah. that's that's really hard on people. When she could speak, she's... Uh, She's preaching God's will. She yeah. <laughs> Let me get my stuff and gather it up. Oh, I need to take that off. I forget that every time. I am so tired right now. Whew. That was a... That was a... These, these messages... I'm excited to see it. She needs it really bad. It lifts her spirit so much. No, yeah, no, it's gonna be Especially with you, Kate, it just just for me. Yeah, she'll probably be. Okay, okay, sorry. Is she on the first floor? She's on the tenth floor. It's oh, very the tenth easy. Of uh, the hospital, three. yes. So, you have to uh, in the Vanderbilt. Yeah. Yeah. Just park in the parking lot, and you walk across the street to the front entrance, and you light up the elevator to the tenth floor. Okay. It's very easy to get there. Very easy. I know you probably don't want to drive there yourself, but she can get somebody to take you. Yeah, I'll take you if you want to go. I'll, I'll come and get you. She really needs it. I will. I want her. Take care, man. I love you. I love you too, Pastor. Oh yeah, I gave you one of these. <laughs> yeah, I wear it too. Okay. <laughs> yes. Howdy. Good night. Hey, how are you? 